Turtles all the way down. I'm Jake, sometimes Jenk. There's a bit of quiet and silence around here right now. Uh, people have been coming by early this morning and, uh, you know, putting, loading up some equipment, some food. We're getting ready for a launch party later tonight. We're going to have uh, the people that have been on the podcast, some of the people that are likely to be guests in the near future, some close friends. And uh, it's going to be a great time. So right before this party, we're going to launch uh, this uh, episode here, episode nine, featuring Mark Kuznicki, who is part of this uh, group or gang of uh, people that I hang around with uh, um, more so the last few years or a few years ago. And these are a group of people that are very smart. They're uh, somewhat meta and theoretical, and they're able to uh, see things from outside and step outside the cave, as we say. But they're also very much uh, into praxis. A lot of these people are into, you know, working with uh, large organizations um, to enact change, to discuss change, to process change, to discuss how change and innovation is implemented in companies, in the world, in society, in politics, etc., uh, Mark Kuznicki is one of these guys and, um, you know, um, always enjoy speaking with him and, uh, he came by recently and we had a talk and, um, and one of my favorites, I enjoyed it. We, we went all over the place, a nice flow to it. Um, you know, we talk about everything from innovation to, uh, politics, local and global neuroscience. Um, we talk about the individual and, uh, and the collective action, you know, these, uh, collective, um, approach to things is, is something that's probably somewhat newer to me. Uh, I used to be, uh, more of a fierce independent, uh, individualist, uh, as I was younger, uh, I thought I could do everything, uh, and go it alone. Uh, I've come to realize that we need people. We need other people. We're mammals. We like to be around other mammals and we're, we're much more effective as is the case with almost any other life form. Uh, we see that they tend to succeed a lot better if they have other life forms around them. That's just uh, pretty much a, a given. Uh, so it's no surprise that we like to gather uh, in groups and, um, and have a good time and break bread as they say. And uh, today we're meeting on the solstice, and it's a winter solstice party, um, gathering, launch, etc. It's kind of a multi-purpose gathering. Um, we used to have a bunch of these uh, um, monthly ex discussion groups that would take place here, and uh, haven't had them in a while. <clears throat> and uh, as Mark, uh, I think, says during the uh, during the conversation that. In a way, this might be a way to get the gang back together, and uh, and maybe it is. Um, I'm just uh, very happy already with the uh, the number of uh, episodes that we've done. That I'm kind of getting back into this groove of of talk. So um, I'll let you know how the party goes uh, on the next uh, monologue, and it seems like we're uh, finally catching up a little bit. Um, as the time lag between when I record these monologues and the episode that you hear right after it is becoming narrower and narrower. Eventually, I'd like it to be pretty much the same day we're moving towards there. So, happy solstice. Enjoy the conversation. Talk soon. So, in a strange sort of way, we have to almost say that uh, Donald Trump is a sort of genius because he's kind of channeling what uh, is happening to a lot of people in America right now and, he is, and, and reflecting it somehow. He is absolutely doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And and he is also the embodiment of something that is deeply dysfunctional within mm -hmm. within the society and within the culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if if it is true that that he was, you know, rejected by his father and is working hard to, to make up for that, you know, mm -hmm. his entire life by being the greatest ever <laughs> in everything that he chooses to do, whether or not he is or not, but creating that as an image. Uh, and, and if he's able to, um, to, to do that by using uh, the tools that he was trained in, which mm -hmm. were you know, salesmanship and, um, complete, um, complete bullying behavior around and, and tapping into this toxic 
masculinity mm -hmm. that is endemic in our culture mm -hmm. um, to assert his will, right? Mm. And yeah. and so it, it's it you can see that in in what in how he presents himself, how he packages himself, and then how our media um, environment actually gives him the validation that he so you know desperately craves. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 then in terms of how that reflects in the culture, we have a culture where a lot of people, a lot of men, um, were raised in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and with a certain belief system about strength and weakness and vulnerability sure. and what those things meant. Uh, and, and so he's reflecting back to those folks, you know, we've had enough mm. of these other people doing well. Right. Right. Cause that's, that's, it's, it's a win lose game. It's a zero sum game. It's kind of like a Ayn Rand universe that, uh, Kind of, yeah. <laughs> it seems to be living in yeah. uh, this glorification of the individual who is going to uh, do great things, and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and the other thing that came through in those in those recordings was this sense of you are born with a talent, mm. and you either have it or you don't. Like there are winners and there are losers, mm -hmm. and they're almost born that way. Mm -hmm. And so for him, he was born a winner, right, from birth. You know, I'm the, I've always been the greatest at, and, um, and it's a myth that he has to maintain, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, I think it's, it's a myth right from the beginning, right? To me, it seems like, um, it's, it's almost an overcompensation, We're doing some armchair psychologizing yeah. here, but it's because it seems like he doesn't actually believe that he's great. Yeah. Is the reason that he has to keep, you know, tooting his own horn. Oh yeah. yeah. No, it all, it's, yeah. it's all, it's all based in shadow, right? Mm -hmm. It's all coming from that dark place. Right. Um, and, and so it, it, it is really interesting how, um, that reflects a lot of where we are in terms of our culture, in terms of our, our, the evolution of humanity, really, mm -hmm. um, where we cannot maintain these old ways of thinking and make the changes that we have to affect in the world. Um, uh, at, at the, at the pace that we need to make those changes. Um, so something's got to give. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's what I find is, is so interesting is how in 2016, the, the mass, the masculine and the feminine mm -hmm. have showed up yep. in the culture oh, yeah. Yeah. embodied by two individuals yeah. who are, um, who are on a global platform. You know, everybody in the world is looking at this battle between the masculine and the feminine yeah. and, and, uh, it's a big, it's a big struggle. It's a cultural struggle. And so there's very little policy. Yeah. And it's also fascinating that, uh, uh, one of the candidates who, who would ostensibly represent the feminine mm -hmm. is trying very hard to represent the masculine. I mean, she does everything she can to stand out to show what a war hawk she is and how much she's yeah. uh, aggressive. And, you know, she, she uh, um, you know, laughs and takes joy in, in, in the killing of Gaddafi and uh, Osama bin Laden. But, you know, for me, it would seem like, you know, maybe to be tolerant and, and somewhat understanding of her, that she needed to do that in order to be taken seriously in the Washington game, it seemed. And yeah. it's kind of sad that uh, that is the reality. But Yes, and mm -hmm. uh, I would suggest that... Um, th when she responds with, um, you know, assertively from a geopolitical point of view, mm -hmm. uh, about, uh, America's role in the world, which, you know, I disagree with some of it and agree with some other, mm -hmm. other parts of it. Um, she is, she's actually expressing a great amount of strength, but mm -hmm. just not necessarily a masculine strength. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's. Yes, you know, if we're talking about war, um, clearly, you know, we could we could talk about where that comes from. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it's possible that the ways in which she will assert power, this is the thing that will be very interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So we have now, you know, this ability to, we'll have this opportunity to compare, mm -hmm. you know, what a, what a female president does uh, right. with and and what uh, and how that power what power is actually expressed, right? Mm -hmm. 
And will it be expressed differently? Will it be expressed the same way? Mm. Um, there's no question that there's power. Yeah. And there's no question that it needs to find expression, right? Right. Because <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. that's the nature of, of geopolitics. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when a woman gets to her age, there's often talk about how they become more, in a sense, masculine, whatever that means, whatever the stereotypical mm-hmm. understandings of that are. Yeah. Um, and uh, there might be some biological reasons for that. I'm not sure, mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's some talk about that. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of sad in a way to, to see that um, we have basically a 1950s version of masculinity versus, I think, kind of like a 1990s version of femininity. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's kind of yeah. 90s. Yeah I, would, yeah, I would say that. Yeah. That's what it kind of looks mean, like. I mean, when you think about uh, the new generation, you know, you know let's call it it's called the millennials, mm. um, as we talk about millennials a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the what we're seeing, I think, is a breaking down of masculine and feminine, and, mm-hmm. and you know, gender expression is shifting, and so many things are are shifting around that. And um, and there's no question that there's a difference between you know uh, Hillary Clinton's version of feminism and. And the and the younger generation's version of it, um, and and you know I'm conscious of the fact that we are two men talking about femininity, mm-hmm. um, which you know is sometimes troubling. Uh, well, there's only two of us here. There's only two of us. <laughs> so, uh, but but I think what's interesting is is that um, as those as those boundaries between masculine and feminine blur, mm-hmm. um, then it becomes, um, it's challenging to many people around their ideas of what masculine and feminine are, mm-hmm. what men and women are supposed to be and do. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's something, you know, that I personally identify with, you know, as a, as a gay man growing up in a small town, Ontario. What town was that, by the way? Uh, when I grew up in small town, Ontario. What, which town was that? Oh, which town? Yeah. Uh, Owen Sound, Ontario. Owen Sound. Okay, so on yeah. Georgian so Bay. I'm trying to get a picture Lo- of it. Yeah. Lovely Georgian Bay, mm-hmm. surrounded by the, the, the uh, yes, the, the base of the Bruce Peninsula. Um, beautiful, t- beautiful place to visit <laughs> in the summer. Nice. Uh, so, you know, growing up as a gay man and having you know, lots of things that were in me that were not m- masculine mm-hmm. and they were, some of them were feminine and some of them were, or expressed themselves in different ways mm-hmm. and, and never having an, a vehicle or a way of talking to reconcile those things, mm-hmm. right. Until much later in life. And now, um, those things are part of the culture, right? People are growing up with, you know, all automatically with, without the defaults that, you know, you can only be one way mm-hmm. and, and the media helps to, to helps people to communicate that. Um, so I think that's, what's part of what's working itself out mm-hmm. in the culture mm-hmm. is, is, is the binary, right. Mm-hmm. And, and which is an important step, I believe, if we're going to zoom out you know, even more to, um, the evolution of human consciousness Hmm. on this planet, right? We, as, as humans, um, are going to, are going through a big shift in how we think and how we see and how we see each other and how we're connected or not connected, Mm -hmm. um, with each other. And so the blurring of those lines, um, is, is a struggle and it's difficult for people to deal with because Mm -hmm. the simplicity was created efficiency, right? Right. The -hmm. simplicity of the lines made things simple. True. Yeah. 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 We do like that black and white view of the the universe and it's, uh, it's the gray that scares a lot of people. And, uh, and and there's some analysis of of the current situation in America is that, uh, it's essentially a reaction to the gray Mm -hmm. and to the grayness of the world that people are more and more starting to realize. And and this naturally you would think would lead some people to nihilism, 
you know, when they see that there are no foundational, uh, you know, uh, platforms on which they can, uh, you know, hang their beliefs on. Exactly. So then they start to think, well, maybe my beliefs are as good as anybody else's because I believe them. Right. And then you get people like, uh, you know, the Trump uh, and and uh, and followers, etc. Who I mean, and you even see people like. Um, Newt Gingrich was on, on uh, you know, being interviewed, and essentially his position is, well, uh, if you believe it, it's true. It seems right. to be what he's saying. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and so that's that's the difficulty that, that we're in right now, is people haven't found a new ground. Right. And um, and we don't have either the philosophical or the, the, the ways of thinking um, that allow us to create a morality that's independent from these rules. Mm-hmm. that we were raised with right. right and and that's that's a deeply difficult philosophical and spiritual problem right well th- well I, this is what the existentialists have, have hit upon it's that uh, when you realize that at, at ground at root there is no ground that you mm-hmm. realize that you're kind of in charge of this you know yeah. you're in charge of your own morality you're, we together collectively are in charge of the world and and the rules by which we live uh, are to be constructed by us and to be followed by us and to built by consensus. Um, and that's the positive response to it, yeah. right? But we're seeing a lot of negative response to it, which is just fear and running away from that responsibility. Totally. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's what... Um, so Dave Gray, um, in his latest book that he uh, did around liminal... He calls liminal, liminal thinking. thinking. Yeah. yeah, this idea of, of how do I how do I deconstruct my own belief systems down to a new um, sensing of reality that can mm. connect with somebody else, mm. right? And, and, I th- and this is a f- super important fundamental problem because, to your point, um, we need to socially construct mm-hmm. some new norms, mm-hmm. right? And the only way that we're going to do that is to have a conversation with the other, Mm-hmm. And and how can we have a conversation with the other? Because mm-hmm. you know everybody has their own belief bubble that they can hold on to, um, and so I think this is this is the work, right? So this is part of um, part of how I see uh, the work that I do and different avenues of it. Um, my partner Chris, he's uh, he's in social work and he. Mm. He, you know, he works in the at the space of of people and their understandings of who they are, hmm. going through change um, all the time, and um, and there's a set of skills mm-hmm. that people weren't raised with uh, to to understand themselves or to reconstruct themselves um, through periods of change, mm-hmm. and if all of us individually and collectively are going through change more and more frequently or continuously, um, then we better have skills Mm -hmm. for, for doing that work. Right. Now, are are you, it seems like you're you're kind of, um, always dealing with change Mm -hmm. and everything you do. It even sounds like people around you, uh, in your personal life as well are dealing with, uh, coping with change in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, are you focusing, uh, on the individual changing, thereby changing the system, or are you talking about systemic change and somehow enacting that so that the individuals change, or is it always, uh, kind of an interplay of both? What, uh, what are you focusing on? Yes. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. No, I, like, I think you have to take a systems view mm. of, of change and, and understand that all the different layers Right. So we have um, this way of doing this in, in, in our work where we talk about, well, um, we are talking to individuals who are leaders. They mm-hmm. may be leaders in the formal sense or in the informal sense. Mm-hmm. Um, they belong to groups, you know, teams. And those groups or teams operate within organizations or larger or other kinds of, of, uh, of larger structures of, mm-hmm. of, of people. And those organizations of people sit within systems. And and how do we make sense at all these different levels? Uh, so at, at one level, you know, a, most of my uh, work, you know, in terms of uh, the work that we do at the moment is very focused on teams and organizations. And then we get dipped down into the individual and say, mm. how are you going? How are you doing mm. through this? You know, mm-hmm. what do you need? to help you as an individual go through this 
um, this change that is, you're called to. Um, because it's not just about what's happening to you, it's how you are called to, uh, to change and to affect change. And then sometimes we get the opportunity to play in a more systems level where you say like, well, there's all these different things are in tight interplays and feedback loops between them. And all you are is you're you with your little group of people that you can affect. That, you know, where can you can intervene right, mm -hmm. in a positive way? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of that, and, you know, happens within, you know, the social and the, and the public sector, you know, where they need to think about the whole, like, how are we doing as a society? What sort of right. public good mm -hmm. are we trying to create mm -hmm. um, in, in this complex, rapidly changing environment? Mm -hmm. um, so, so for me, you cannot separate the individual from the system and, mm -hmm. and vice versa, because it's, it's all of it. I mean, and that's why I'm very appreciative of anybody, um, in the world that's doing work at the level of, um, you know, self, uh, self-awareness, mm -hmm. consciousness raising, you know, collective cultural expression because those are great enablers for many people to, to help them make sense mm -hmm. in, in, in the world. And if right. we have more of that going on, then it's helping a lot of people make sense of a lot of things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, how do they find you? I mean, are these people that realize they need to change and are looking for someone to help them to do that? Or is it that there's so much change going on and they're reacting and they're saying, well, this is fucked up. I need something and I yeah. don't know what. Well, um, so how they find us, mm -hmm. um, the, it's useful to have a uh, jargon working for you. <laughs> yeah. So when someone says innovation, mm. they Google it, <laughs> <laughs> they can find us. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but in, in, in truth, what that means is innovation and change are really part of the, of the same thing. And what, what happens is people will say, Oh, you know, we have in a company, we have this corporate strategy in the, in, and we have five bullets, mm -hmm. right? Bullet one says, sell more stuff. Mm. Bullet two says, sell something new. Mm. Um, bullet three says, be great, you know, and, and tell, and, and, and build our brand. And bullet five somewhere says, innovate. Right. Okay. And so you get to bullet five and go, innovate. Mm. How do we do that? Mm. Are we doing that right now? What is that? What is that? <laughs> what does innovation mean? Yeah. You know, have we defined that for ourselves? So often um, we get called in when people said, yeah, we've had this mandate to innovate for a while. It's not working out so well. Mandate to innovate. A mandate to innovate. Well, somebody yeah. somebody, somebody mm -hmm. in, you know, in the C-suite said, mm -hmm. we're going to be more innovative. <laughs> Interesting. Without any kind of right. path necessarily. Yeah. And, and because of the jargon and the loaded and completely useless term that that mm. innovation is unfortunately it does describe something but it's also open to so much interpretation mm -hmm. um no if people don't actually define what they mean and what it means here and what it means for us and what it means for you and me and how we work together yeah then it's just a bullet point <laughs> so um so really often what what uh, what we do in our work is there's somebody that's been charged with that mandate. Say, we're going to be more innovative. Can you help make that happen for us? Right. Yep, I'm going to be your chief innovation officer or mm. your VP innovation. Right. Um, and so they they begin and they have everybody has different models that they like, and and it's just it's really really hard work. Mm. It's really really hard work. There's lots and lots of barriers. Um, you know, most organizations are designed in a way to actually reject the new. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's you, built in, right? Yeah. It's a lonely place to be, mm -hmm. to be that person with that mandate. I'm swimming upstream constantly. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to just keep on doing the same thing that we've done. But if we keep doing that, we're going to go over a cliff. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this happens within organizations. It's happen It's happening at a societal level. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
that's the moment when we get to have the the first conversation. It's about, you know, how are we doing with that? What is in our culture as an organization that's getting in the way? How are leaders behaving? You know, what teams do we have? What skills do they have? What skills are they missing? Mm. How do you do this work well? You know, well, it turns out that that this work, you know, the work of creating the new is, um, is a rapidly evolving practice in itself. Mm -hmm. So the world's changing quickly. The tools that you have to use to address those changing needs are changing rapidly Mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to keep up with. Right. So sometimes you need help. And, and a lot of these changes, uh, if you, if you ask, uh, you know, most people, they will say it has something to do with technology, what, however sure. they see that, that term. Um, and, and often they're thinking about, uh, maybe something as simple as, uh, machines and social networks that, uh, are around that weren't around before the changing media landscape. Um, even, it, even the changing the sense of the self, you mm-hmm. know, when you're on social media, uh, as we, most of us are, uh, you know, during the day, it, it, I think you're starting to develop a different conception of yourself. Are you not? Are, yeah. are, are you totally noticing anything there? Yeah. i um, all of it. Um, <laughs> so that's, what's, I think the biggest fallacy in, in the innovation space is innovation equals technology, mm-hmm. right? And technology is a huge driver. It's an enormous driver. I'm not going to underplay it, mm-hmm. um, of change and, Meanwhile, you know, there are things happening in the environment. There are things that are happening socially around people's values. There are things that are happening politically. There are things that are happening um, all around and influenced by technology and influencing technology. And some people have very little awareness of all the implications, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, it's it's very reasonable to expect within a few years that self-driving trucks will be the norm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Self-driving trucks will create massive unemployment for mm-hmm. millions of people who that's what they do. Right. And we have no ways of understanding what the implications are of that, right? Yeah. And and so we there's both the work itself that's much more than technology and there's also the implications of the work which are definitely beyond technology. Mm-hmm. Um, Black Mirror is amazing. You know, I we just to watched that, that last night uh, for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So season three, amazing. episode one of Black Mirror. I did watch that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that was yeah. the first episode I watched. Actually, yeah. Was it? So, wow. yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that when, when you get to see, this is how, you know, you know, in the social media sense, like, mm-hmm. Oh, is that person a 4.2? Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a 3.8. Right. I need to appeal to the 4.2 to get some points. That was know. scarily uh, represented. It is. It is the real. This is the thing. This is why I love, you know, science fiction and mm-hmm. futurism is to take something that's already happening and take it to an, to, you know, an ultimate level to see it, mm-hmm. truly see it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's why, you know, part of the work that I really, um, uh, in enjoying more and more lately is, um, doing, uh, futures work with mm-hmm. people to actually understand trends and explore what the future scenarios look like. And then they explore these f- like four massively divergent future scenarios, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we, 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 we amplify them so that they really stand out right and then you look at them and you go all of this is already happening that's right. <laughs> you it's don't have to right. extrapolate very much to i know <laughs> it's so this is the thing about the future the future is now it's right here it's unevenly distributed it's unevenly right? yeah. distributed it's all those things <laughs> yeah and um so so it it triggers for people the need to both what the heck am, are we doing you know mm. how are we going to adapt to this future that is now Mm -hmm. and it's not something that we can take our time with Mm -hmm. you know there's there's an urgency Mm -hmm. um, around change Um, and we're we're going to be busy to in order to within whatever part of the economy we live to change ourselves in order to adapt in order to survive Mm -hmm. economically Mm -hmm. and then there's all the externalities of that that are being created societally 
Right. And so we're going to have like technology driven unemployment will be the problem of the 21st century. It's already begun. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say even maybe in the next 10 years, we're going to see some drastic uh, labor shifts. Yeah. And uh, we're not ready for it, are we? I mean, no, we're not no. ready mm. for it at all. And when, mm. you, know, the, you know, Canada's Minister of Finance says, oh, you know, temporary work is, is the new normal, mm. he's speaking both the truth and nobody wants to hear that. Right. Like mm-hmm. he gets shut down for saying such things. Mm-hmm. Nobody's having an honest conversation about it, mm-hmm. right? Well, it's not politically expedient to have those conversations, unfortunately, <laughs> the way uh, we've it, set it up. It's right? not. It yeah. is not at all. Mm-hmm. And and so this is enormous, right? This is enormous. Um, so, for example, um, and this is where I want to advocate for a critical view on the word and the practice of innovation, right? Okay. Um, so in Canada, you know, we're next year, 2017, 150th, uh, birthday of Canada, uh, the sesquicentennial, which is my 50th birthday. Is it right around that time? Yeah. Oh, (laughs) you've been around for one third of Canada's life. I always know what, how old Canada is because I just had a hundred. Oh, that's great. (laughs) Um, so, so in, in, in looking forward to that, there's so many events that are going to happen. And there's a, a group of events that have been put, to get, put together under the, uh, uh, the name Innovation 150. So mm. there's a lot of innovation mm. language that's mm-hmm. going to be a big theme. Is it just talk or what's happening there? Well, I don't know enough okay. to say, but um, it's always talk, right? Yeah. Talk, but talk is necessary also. Right. Um, talk is not, to me, talk is a form of action, mm-hmm. uh, as long it's as it's, start there, as long as it's good, yeah. mm-hmm. good dialogue. Right. Mm-hmm. So the thing to me that is important and for anybody that is, that sees themselves as part of the innovation space, however you define it mm-hmm. is we need to have some critical conversations mm-hmm. about what are the effects of the work that we're doing, right? right. What are the effects on the economy? It, cause we believe that economic that innovation is a is a fantastic economic driver mm-hmm. which we can create wealth for sure at the same time as we're creating massive unemployment right we can yeah. do we can do both things yeah but the wealth is going to be concentrated it yeah. will be concentrated well mm-hmm. so we need solutions for this right right so in the context of a country like canada at this moment in time looking into the future reflecting on its past you know, there's an amazing opportunity to actually have a real conversation about how do we reinvent ourselves for the mm-hmm. future that we're about to enter. Um, and it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking around mm-hmm. to see who is, who wants to have a really critical conversation about that. Um, is this at the level of the federal government? That, because if we're talking about Canada 150, are they the ones that are kind of driving this? It's or? yes and no. I mean, okay. it is it is a multi you know sector mm. okay. um, uh, you know uh, federation of in, individuals and groups that all want mm. to be part of this. Similar to the the centennial in 1967 was very mm. much a a social and political exercise and in. in in, in nation building, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of a coming out party for Canada. It yeah. Like it, 67 it, was. Yeah. It, it very is. It very mm-hmm. much was. And, and mm-hmm. it, it also created a mythology, mm-hmm. right? A mythology of Canada right. that we live with today. And some people want to uh, say we're still that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and those of us that are, again, a bit more critical would say that myth is a myth, right? And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, what are we doing in terms of in ter- terms of indigenous rights? Mm. Right. What are we talking about when we say Canadian culture? Mm-hmm. Are we actually talking about settler culture right. and the colonialist and, view? Yeah. The colonialist view of mm-hmm. Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you know, as a white male who was a first is a first generation Canadian with immigrant mm-hmm. parents, you know, I am one of many. You know, settlers to this to this land, and um, so as we as we approach um, this this new era of technology driven globalized change, mm-hmm. in we have we come back to a place, you know, and a land that has a history, and 
I do believe that if if we don't actually address the central um, uh, shame of mm. of Canada, yeah, we cannot enter the future honestly. Well, at least we're starting to talk about it now. It I seems know. With this, yeah, that's like it's a first it's, when you actually have a prime minister even talking about it. Yeah, which it's is it's super courageous. exciting, right? Mm-hmm. And we're so just at the beginning. Yeah. So just at the beginning. And it's, it's, you know, it's not for me as a white person to, mm. uh, to really say what's necessary, but I will join with anybody to, mm-hmm. to, to try to figure out what, what we do. So, so do you think Justin Trudeau is authentically trying to do something about it or is he being a cynical in a way and uh, winning votes and talk? I guess, I mean, he seems to be getting a bit of a backlash these days. Yeah, very, very right recently. now. Yeah. Right mm-hmm. now, there is some stuff that was quite, it gives me pause, mm-hmm. right? I was, you know, you know, I voted for mm-hmm. him. I've been very supportive of a lot of the language mm-hmm. that he uses. It's It's definitely in line with my own values. He knows what to say. He Let's hope he knows say. what to do. Yeah. He knows what to say. Mm-hmm. And so where he, where he really didn't know what to say, or he said really the wrong thing, was when he made a commitment to say, you know, hey, this the past election is going to be the last one that we yeah. do under first past the post. We're going to get some form of professional proportional representation uh, in in the next election. And then he says, well, you know, that was really needed when you had yeah. Harper in government Come because on. they're yeah. bad mm-hmm. and we're good and people like <laughs> us and people like me. He was basically saying, people like me, so we don't need to reform. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Which is insane. Mm-hmm. So, again, there's, you know, no matter who the leader is, mm-hmm. you know, there is always a problem when we give the leader too much um, authority. And when they have it, they're not going to give it up right? very easily. Mm-hmm. And and so it's up to people to keep them accountable. And so, you know, I was pleased to see that there was some backlash to that and that mm-hmm. people, you know, there was a recalibration of the language again. Mm-hmm. But um, it clear he's clearly at the point where the language needs to turn into action Mm -hmm. and their, their agenda is enormous. Mm -hmm. The challenges are huge. Uh, the systems that they have to work with in terms of the bureaucracy and the, and the the machinery of government are clunky Mm -hmm. and old and not up to, uh, up to change at the, at the pace that it is maybe required. Um, and, and so within government, there's an enormous appetite to figure out how do we get all this stuff done in the time that we have to get it done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, and I'm telling you, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of figuring out how do you, how do you bring people along as you actually lead change? Um, and there's a, is a part where I think leadership, the, the importance of leadership is to be able to, to reflect um, the, reflect the, the reflect to people uh, a mirror to themselves that allows us to move forward, right? Mm-hmm. And and to the extent that um, that just Justin Trudeau is able to um, stop being an object mm-hmm. of admiration mm-hmm. and start being more a mirror of a conversation, yeah. Um, and and the and the leader of a conversation into us rethinking and reimagining how we could be together mm-hmm. on this land, then he will be a great leader, mm-hmm. right? If, if people continue to package him as a, as a star, right. as opposed to let him be a genuine, authentic leader, mm-hmm. then I think that is where the danger lies. We seem to have kind of a great advantage in Canada. I mean, I feel like the tasks are not as, uh, you know, uh, difficult for Canada mm-hmm. as some other place. I mean, we've got great resources. We've got, you know, a pretty good culture of tolerance, uh, relatively speaking, mm-hmm. compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I feel like we should be doing more 
you know, mm-hmm. Canada uh, on the world stage. But mm-hmm. uh, it's almost like a, it seems to be our nature that we don't want to stick our heads up too high, lest oh, yes. it gets chopped off. Exactly. And uh, that seems to apply uh, internationally as well. Absolutely, it does. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing is, again, as um, many, uh, many newcomers to Canada no- notice, mm-hmm. right, is the, the tall poppy syndrome. Right. And so... You know, with myself, you know, uh, you know, having German parents, there's a certain, um, there's a certain uh, uh, way of showing up as mm-hmm. <laughs> that it, yeah. from that culture, uh, which is um, uh, blunt and mm-hmm. says, you know, you say what you mean. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the the Anglo Canadian skill of being passive aggressive. <laughs> Is something that so I true. had to learn right. because you have to learn it. Yeah. If you don't learn how to do it, you're not going to fit within this You'll culture. You'll be an outsider. Yeah. You will be an outsider. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, uh, cultures are incredibly, uh, stable, mm-hmm. you know? And so there is no matter how many newcomers will come in, they will all go through that process of culturation to the, to the norm. Mm-hmm. Um, Unless we, unless something else happens, right? Mm-hmm. Unless, and then, unless there's another shift that in in that culture, mm-hmm. and so when you talk about you know our competitiveness or where we fit in the world stage, it's very much a uh, an expression of of that core culture. I think. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you think about the future? Is it is it optimistic? Is it pessimistic? How do you internalize what's about to happen? Great question. Mm. I am not, I'm not, um, one or the other. I have, yeah, like it's, it's very interesting because, um, when you start to exercise the skills around futuring or futures thinking, Mm -hmm. um, and you realize that we live in a multiverse (laughs) that, that the future, there are, you know, the future is not fully knowable. Um, it can go many, many different directions. Um, and, and all of those things are possibilities. Some of them are extremely negative. Some Mm -hmm. of them are, are positive and, Mm -hmm. and hopeful. And so, um, what I think, it doesn't matter whether I'm optimistic or pessimist, pessimistic, what matters is what do we, what do we do, Mm -hmm. right? What do we do today that starts to (laughs) move things in a positive direction. Um, so I am hopeful that a new generation of people that aren't bound to legacy thinking mm-hmm. have the opportunity to actually um, um, adapt themselves and adapt the culture that they will create um, mm-hmm. to the conditions that we'll find ourselves in. Because humans have always been extremely, uh, adaptive. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why we win. That's why we win. Yeah. And that's part of the price that we also have to pay, right? Right. Is how we've won. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, 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 I believe that we'll all will, as a civilization, we will continue to develop in, in, and we we will continue in some, in some form. Um, when we talk about, you know, the, uh, the disruption to employment and, and who are the winners and the losers, I know there's going to be a lot of losers. There's yeah. going to be a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. And that change is going to be very, very difficult. Um, and so um, it's not about being necessarily, you know, optimistic about what, mm-hmm. you know, the mm-hmm. future of the human race, the future of the planet. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, myself. I mean, yeah, people are thinking about these things. I think more than ever before. I don't know. It seems like uh, every generation has this apocalyptic sense that uh, these are the end times, and what mm. are we doing? Things are going too fast. It's not going to be uh, yeah. the same anymore. Everything's gone to shit. What have you? Yeah. But um, it seems like more people are thinking that these yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, there's plenty of evidence yeah. uh, of of. <clears throat> of a dark future. Mm-hmm. So there's no shortage of it. Yeah. Uh, there's plenty of signals mm-hmm. to, to pick up on it. And, and at the same time I go, well, you know, if, uh, 
you know, if Elon Musk cracks the code of energy, hmm. uh, what could that do? Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and so I'm, there's, there's one genius that I look to yeah. and, and, and I'm hopeful <clears throat> about. Um, and if, and if, and think that history moves in waves, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, and we, this is the problem with a linear th ideas of time mm -hmm. is, is that if you realize, well, actually it's a cycle, mm -hmm. it's a circle, mm -hmm. you know, we're just going through one stage of that circle. I, I see spirals. It's spirals. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, because it's still moving a, in some direction, it, but it seems to be circulating in some way and repeating itself. And exactly, others. yeah. And so we will go through a, re, a regressive stage. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's that's <clears throat> entirely possible. Yeah. So I mean, when, I, when when you see this environment that I just described, in which everyone is kind of somewhat more pessimistic than they used to be, somewhat more fearful of the future. Um, it's true. It's kind of cliche, but it's true that that's an opportunity, right? I mean, it's, 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 this is how things will have to change because yeah. we're not very good at pro proactive change. We're going to react to things. So once everything is kind of feels like it's going through the shredder, this is the time to do it. Absolutely. But unfortunately what happens is a lot of the, uh, the assholes are waiting in the wings for things like this and they'll take advantage of this, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. even like disaster capitalism is, was one way to look at it yeah. and, uh, you know, taking advantage of, of, um, uh, the things going through the shredder. So yeah. to me, it seems like, uh, when you mention people like Elon Musk and geniuses of other kinds and, and mm -hmm. more, uh, in the more colloquial sense, it seems like there's no shortage of great ideas. Mm -hmm. It's just, how are we going to actually get the people together to do something? Yeah. Right. And yeah. that seems to be the challenge. And that's kind of what you're working yeah. in, right? Like getting yeah. people to enact the change that they need to enact. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so individual and collective sense making mm. in order to s start the process of building and creating, right? That is, that is the work, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that means is, um, yeah, you're right that change often, we will use this, the term, a burning platform. Mm. You need a burning platform right. to affect, to you affect change. Jump off. You gotta jump off. You have no choice. You have to jump. You're gonna <laughs> right. have to jump. So something needs to be destroyed in order for something else to be created, mm. right? And so creative destruction uh, is a really important step, um, and it's an essential step. Um, we actually use this model of the eco-cycle with organizations to talk about birth, growth, mm. maturity, creative destruction, renewal, and rebirth, right? Mm. And, and if you look at any system, including an organization, there are things that are in birth, there are things that are in maturity, there are things that are stuck that really need to be creatively destroyed, but nobody's willing to make the decision. Mm -hmm. So that to me is an incredibly fertile space, mm -hmm. right? Is let's look at the things that are stuck that have passed maturity, but have not been creatively destroyed and destroy them. Mm -hmm. You make a decision. Right. right. And this is where boldness is needed and this is where leadership is needed. Mm -hmm. So if we look within Canada, right? Mm -hmm. So one space that I've been looking at recently is media. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Digital disruption, media, journalism. Huge changes. Huge yeah. changes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a number of people who, you know, are saying, well, we have to retain mm -hmm. and maintain the thing that the old right? Mm -hmm. In some new way. So we're going to have to come up with a, a way to maintain the old. And, and I want to challenge that and say, like, we're going to have to think about what things can we just let go of? Right. Because the organizations and the mediums that they created and the products that they created for the transmission of knowledge are not what's important. Mm. What's important is the knowledge. Mm the mediums right. and the channels will change and should change. And so um, at a policy level within a place like Canada that has to have some sort of policy around its culture and its content, um, there is an enormous need right now to critically evaluate what are the things that we actually need to hold on to and what are the things that we can let go of. 
But people are terrified of change, right? Yes. Especially uh, not to sound too elitist, but if they're not as informed. Mm -hmm. uh, when you don't understand something or the complexity of something, it's the natural reaction is to be fearful of it and to avoid it and to yeah. even resist it. Yeah. And um, I mean, so I think of like the 1960s when uh, I can almost compare what's going on right now to what I imagined uh, the 60s to be like. Although, you know, I wasn't really around for it, but... Mm -hmm. It seemed like there was a huge burgeoning of, of, of energy, of positive energy, yeah. uh, a lot of uh, appetite for change. But uh, what we saw on a systemic level, and, and, and we're seeing again today, is that there seems to be institutional resistance to it. Not just institutional resistance, but also a vast majority of, well, a vast majority, but at least half the people seem to be very much disinclined towards that world view. Yeah. Um, and then you have people like Nixon, you know, come on board and, and try to douse those flames of, uh, you know, of optimism. And um, but I, I think of them as kind of like uh, the last dying breaths. I hope they are of mm. the last dying breaths of an old way of being that mm -hmm. we have to kind of, uh, you know, suffer through once in a while, the flare ups of it and then kind of douse that. Yeah. Uh, I like to think that we're going through a similar stage right now in which you're getting this, uh, you know, the last vestiges of this uh, crazy, uh, I, I call it crazy, you know, kind of like hyper-masculine type of, mm. uh, approach to the world of, of you know, basically, uh, um, I mean, it, it's very much tied in with the capitalist raping and pillaging of the world, essentially, yeah. right? Um, but now we're having, in a strange sort of way, the media, which you, you you're, you're focusing on, has kind of co-opted those people to actually take the side of resistance, mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, being the agents of, of truth. Yeah, and that's that's a disturbing thing. And with the media concentration that we're seeing, it's it's more and more difficult to uh, have a respect for, let's call it truth, mm -hmm. <laughs> or at least, uh, you know. Being of a philosophy background, it's it's hard for me to say truth with uh, you know with any certainty, obviously. Right. But, but I think it would <laughs> it's it's such a problem to be a philosopher. Like how do you say that word? I know. But I uh, but I think in terms of of deception rather yeah. than truth, it's like I may not know what the truth is, but I can tell when I'm being deceived or when I'm deceiving somebody else, right. and I like to avoid that situation. Yeah. It seems like we have uh, gone very far in the opposite direction of that recently, yeah. especially with the, with the media's, uh, output. Yeah. It seems like deception is baked right in. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe that has, uh, something to do with the fact that advertising has become so entrenched in the media that they're inseparable and advertising is all about deception in a way. It's about yeah. moving you towards making decisions that are not rational or mm -hmm. non-rational. Mm -hmm. It is, that is that you're not necessarily using your thinking mm -hmm. to arrive at your decisions to to enact your behaviors you're you're relying on responses of, of fear and titillation or what have you and what yeah. advertising does for us yeah. uh politics obviously caught on to that uh, uh you know very quickly yeah. and uh political advertising political campaigns are advertising campaigns i mean they're, yeah. they're they really have very little to do with again in quotation marks truth yeah that's frightening yeah I don't know how to get around that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like, how do you, how do you even blow that up? Yeah. <laughs> you know, huge question. Oh yeah. my God. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is where I think, uh, there seems to be so much happening in the field of neuroscience right now mm. around understanding how the human brain works, which is both incredibly exciting and also fraught with danger, like mm -hmm. anything. Right. So like any innovation, like any new discovery, you know, understanding how the human brain works can be a, um, you know, a tool for transcendence and, and self-discovery. And it can also be a tool for mass manipulation. Mm -hmm. And so the question then becomes for me, not how do you prevent mass manipulation but how do you enable self-discovery and realization and mm -hmm. and all those positive things right mm -hmm. so that's where i tend to focus my energy is towards amplifying those things that are using those tools for good and mm -hmm. my good my yeah. definition of the good sure yeah. you know you're allowed using, that using my own <laughs> of yeah. good and um but really what that uh, is about is about um, how do we, you know, use all of these amazing technologies, tools, methods to create a better place for people, 
Like hmm. that is where I come back down to. We are people mm-hmm. and we should be doing those things that create better things for people. Hmm. And I'm a person. And <laughs> if it's just, if it's good for me, but it's bad for everybody else, mm-hmm. that is bad. <laughs> so the focus is people. When you say people, do you mean like species wide? Do you mean, because it seems yeah. like our history of our people, uh, people in general is that we, we start off with kind of a small tribalistic uh, yeah. approach. And then we kind of enlarge that sphere to include the nation state. And yeah. some of us have included, you know, the global uh, world and, 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 yeah. and humanity as a group. And and some even further, like I relate, yeah. I, I identify as a mammal more than as, <laughs> more than as a human. Interesting. These days, it's like you know they deserve the respect uh, yeah. that you know that humans get as well. And I, it yeah. seems like there's an ever broadening of of this yeah. inclusiveness in terms of what we're defining ourselves and what we're hoping to uh, uh, look out for in, yeah. in, in the future. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would identify with that. Right? Mm-hmm. Is 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 this enlarging or the breaking down of divisions, right? Mm. And um, and there is a counter, you know, there's a counter movement, right, to mm-hmm. a neo-tribalism, a, right. a, hun- a, a hunkering down and a bunker mentality. Right. And what's interesting, I think, is, and I want to read more about it, is, is like, again, neuroscience of conservatism and liberalism, right? How mm. people think. And oh, what, that's fascinating Right, it's, it is yeah. fascinating when you mm-hmm. look at these are different kinds of brains, mm-hmm. right? They are fundamentally differently different sizes of kinds of brains, and what the what social media and the overall media sphere is enabling is the separation mm-hmm. between those people that think one way and those th- people that think the other way. Yeah. Uh, so now they're becoming less interconnected and actually more isolated from each other, mm-hmm. uh, which sets up quite a quite yeah. a, a nasty set of conflicts but th- this this separation um it, it does seem to be kind of a half and half it seems mm-hmm. like whatever culture you go into th- there seems to be kind of a cleave down the middle for yeah. almost any major issue it's almost yeah. uh like people take sides even if they're kind of close to the center they'll they'll skew one way or the other because yeah. people want to be on a team maybe I yeah mean, is that uh is, is that what we're doing is it our natural human um tribalistic tendencies that are kind of getting in the way yeah. of, of how we are to maybe meet in the middle, but we don't, we, we don't, we go to the right or left. Yeah. And that's why, I, that's why I'm kind of thinking about the future again in this, in a multiverse kind of way. Right? Tell me what you mean by multiverse. I mean that, yeah. that simultaneously there will, there are going to be, there are going to be different realities living simultaneously in the same place. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and so you could, Talk about in- income inequality is one manifestation of that. Mm-hmm. You know, there is, you know, conservative media and liberal media and people's truth. Is there liberal media? I don't know. <laughs> if you ask the conservatives, they say it's, conservatives, all, liberal it's media. all liberal media. <laughs> and if you ask liberals, it's just like, oh, it's all corporate media. That's right. Uh, so, so there's have, that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's that dispute. There's that dispute. Yeah. And, um, and so what's what's interesting to me is that um, because there was an interesting thing I came across, I forget whose reference it was, where people were saying, okay, it, you can have globalization, uh, you can have state uh, state authority, state, um, you know, a, a, a strong state, mm-hmm. uh, and you can have democracy. But you can't have all three. Right. You have to choose two. It's always like that, isn't it? Right? What is that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> can't have everything. You can't have everything. So if you have globalization and strong states mm-hmm. without democracy, because mm. the state has be- separated itself from the people and yeah. needs to assert control in order to maintain a certain balance, uh, that's one solution so to like the problem. Russia, maybe, or something yeah, like that? Yeah, it's a little that. bit like Russia, mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have um, state authority um, with democracy, but no globalization, which mm-hmm. means isolated islands. Yeah, Venezuela, yeah, okay. Right, isolated, mm-hmm. isolated islands um, that uh, are able to maintain an internal social order, but actually disconnect a little bit from the, mm. from the, from the global. Um, so you look at if you can have globalization and democracy, but no states. Right. What would that look like? Right? That sounds like the best of the those options that you just presented, doesn't it? It does to yeah. me. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and if you are, um, if you are an American in the Midwest and with a certain mythology, born with a certain mythology, that mm. is the worst thing. Right. So because you're the, giving up America, because you're sense. giving up your yeah. sovereignty, mm-hmm. right? And and so without sovereignty, uh, there is no democracy in that mm. in that in that construct, right? So whether a global democracy is actually even possible. I don't know. Because the EU yeah. can't do it. Yeah, I don't know. Right? Yeah. So who knows, right? So to me, what, you know, that idea of the future is already here is just unevenly distributed means that um, depending on where you are on the planet, you're going to be experiencing these different futures, mm-hmm. right? You're going to be living in these different different worlds. Uh, and all of them will be si- happening simultaneously. The interesting thing is when those worlds have, how, what is the medium through which those worlds have conversations with each other? Hmm. Right. So, so is is, it the internet? Is it the internet? Is it Mm -hmm. war? Mm-hmm. Right? Is That's it a terrible form of communication? Right? But it's, a ter- is. it's a terrible, <laughs> it is a form of, you know, it's, it's the medium is the message. Um, but so, so that is to me where the kind of future that we're, heading into is is um is uh, you know very divergent um and yet um there will be a need to create new institutions that will uh, mediate mm. the relationships between all these different worlds right that that people mm. will be inhabiting and um so you know I think science fiction explores this in lots of different ways. Mm. You know, any, any of the, any of those where people are basically, you know, the, the privileged are uploaded Mm -hmm. and go to, you know, Elysium. Right. right? And those that are left behind Mm -hmm. and the hellscape that they occupy. Um, and both can be true. Well, that, that's a likely scenario in the future, isn't it? I mean, when I think in terms of, um, for example, life extension technologies, Mm -hmm. uh, they're starting to happen. You know, yeah. you've got some 3D printing of body parts, you know, nanotechnology, stem cell research. Yeah. Uh, I can envision something in the very near future where you have uh, certain um, procedures that are going to extend life dramatically. And, of course, as is usual, only the, the rich are going to be able to, to do it at first. Mm-hmm. Uh, that seems to me like a, a natural recipe for fomenting a revolution. It's mm-hmm. like if you can imagine what other reason would you really have to, to fight stronger for than if you see a bunch of people, you know, uh, doing something that they're going to live for uh, hundreds of years and you and your family have to be uh, content with uh, the, the regular life expectancy. Yeah. People aren't going to necessarily accept that. Or mm. they might accept it. Yeah. Tell me how. Well, because, you know, we're in, we're lobsters in a pot that's slowly mm. warming up. Right. And, uh, and people do adjust, you yeah. know, Isn't to all true? sorts of yeah terrible conditions mm-hmm. right especially um, if they're being manipulated to do so absolutely <laughs> so so, yeah. so you know when i again you know i'm gonna pick picking on my poor german parents mm. but you know m- my mother was born in 1933 mm. the year hitler came to power wow. in germany in germany wow. right so mm-hmm. she's a baby right hmm. uh as hitler comes to power she goes to elementary school you hmm. know during the nazi years and the shit is hitting the fan shit's hitting the fan mm-hmm. and and then you know at by the end of the war she's still a, a child and she uh, returns to the the city of of her birth from the countryside where they had been evacuated mm. and start to rebuild right wow. and with my father they decide you know it, it, they come of age around that time just post-war 1952 1953 4 um, and decide where we're going to go, you know, mm-hmm. Australia, New yeah. Zealand, Canada, natural choices, right? The natural mm-hmm. choices. Mm-hmm. United States was not an option for some reason. Mm. Don't know why. Hmm. Uh, well, my father anyway. Um, and, and so I, th- I think about that. I th- and, and so growing up in, in Canada, in a very Anglo Saxon, you know, kind of community, mm-hmm. um, where my, where my friends were, uh, English, Scottish, etc. They were on the other side of the war, yeah. uh, and, and and so you know, at a very young age, I was I was called the Nazi or whatever. Really, the, even, uh, even oh in yes, your time. No 19, kidding. Yeah, nineteen 
you know, I'm born 1970, so like huh. late 70s, 80s, the consciousness, as soon as people learn about that history, uh, right, and it's a really so. easy thing to go, boom. Right. So I had to understand, how is it that people that I am connected to, right, manage to allow that to happen, right? Yeah. Right? And, you know, in my family were communists and socialists, mm-hmm. right? They were they were coal miners and unionists and 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 were not part of you know a fascist kind of um, right. mindset. So this is your grandparents that were yeah. adults at the time. Right? Yeah, my, yeah, my grandparents and they're mm-hmm. working in coal mines, mm-hmm. and um, and so how did that happen, right? And ha- and so it's it's so easy to say you know Trump is the new Hitler or mm. whatever, and th- fill in the blank is the new Hitler, right. but the but it's not about it's not. It's less about Hitler, and it's more about what are those conditions that those people mm. were in and went through that allowed him, right? That mm-hmm. enabled him, mm-hmm. right? That created those conditions, and and where that could go, you know, how yeah. far could that? How far could human degradation and depravity go? And we've demonstrated that it can go very deep. It can go very, very deep. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know where we started with this, but, <laughs> but basically I, that's how I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the conditions of people that are going to be the losers, mm. right, in, in this bifurcated future mm-hmm. is they're going to be in a state where they can be controlled, mm-hmm. right? They can be controlled. They will be manipulated. Um, by either the privileged class or people of their own who mm-hmm. decide to take advantage of that opportunity for their personal power. And, and it seems like back again to this notion that about half the people seem to be okay with that, uh, being controlled, and in fact welcome it and ask for it and want to be told yeah. uh, what to do. And th- there seems to be a, a very much a conflict there between two types. For sure. Of Authoritarians and non-authoritarians. Yeah. Right? yeah, when you're talking about the neuroscience of it, there seems to be, you know, I, I often wonder if this is, um, I mean, there's a nature-nurture type thing that we talk mm-hmm. about all the time, but... You think of, I don't know, uh, some insect species, for example, that uh, um, however they do it seem to cue into something that's about to happen uh, climatologically in the, mm. in the near future in the season. And they have this response species wide in which mm. they're maybe producing certain types of offspring or reducing their offspring or, or, mm. or you know, changing, uh, expressing different genes within yeah. to become locusts or something else. Yeah. I mean, are we susceptible to this kind of thing? And if we are, uh, because we're kind of in a globalized, uh, you know, media landscape right now, yeah. if we were ever susceptible to that sort of thing, I think it's now because everyone is kind of on a similar page and they have yeah. more access to... Uh, a, a kind of a consistent view of what's happening in the world and m- closer to real time. Mm-hmm. It seems like if we can react in a kind of a species wide way, this is the time that we'd be doing it. Yeah. You think so? Yeah. And I wonder yeah. if we're doing that. You yeah. Know, if we're having this. That's, it's a great mm. question. And I think the, um, so if you think of, so we'll call that evolutionary biology, mm. right? The relationship between evolutionary biology and neuroscience, right. and the relationship between neuroscience and what you might call behavioral economics, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So how how people behave and how that creates um, it, that informs their economic decisions, um, and all of that, you know, it, within within the sphere of politics uh, at the same time. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, there's so many puzzles there mm. to be explored and. You know, if I were an academic, I might be exploring some of those right now. Yeah. Um, but I'm not. So, <laughs> so what I, the only thing I can do is, is to look and see signals and patterns and, and note mm-hmm. those patterns. And so what I am noting is that people that are, um, that are non-authoritarian, globally minded, interconnected, having conversations with each other are converging towards certain norms and behaviors Mm -hmm. um, that I would see as more positive and I would identify with, Mm -hmm. you know, some of those are are certain practices that they are are coming to. So different forms of mindfulness, Mm -hmm. right. Are part, are are part of that. So self awareness and understanding that the brain um, is, is malleable that, uh, that you have the ability to influence you know, how you think Mm -hmm. and through how you think creates 
reality, right? right. That you are mm -hmm. able to shape mm -hmm. your future by actually working with your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that's an incredibly powerful, you know, capability. Yeah. Um, and, and very, very exciting. So to think of millions of people, you know, converging towards those kinds of practices and what that means in the collective is, is super exciting. Right. Yeah. And, and then on the other side, we have the authoritarian mind, which is fearful mm -hmm. and which retreats into itself. Mm -hmm. And instead of higher order mind functions is going back into the lizard brain of, you know, fear, uh, you know, depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and what that part of the mind does. Yeah. Yeah. That part of the mind is dangerous. It is. But it's necessary as and well. And necessary. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of easy to dismiss it all, and I find myself doing it all the time. It's like, let's get rid of that side, and let's mm -hmm. work on the other side. But, um, I mean, anxiety and neurosis are evolutionarily built-in ways to protect us in a way. I mean, yes. it's uh, the conservatism even. I mean, you don't want to go too far into, uh, you know, innovation <laughs> yeah. too fast. Yeah. Because, uh, there, as we know, there's unintended consequences. And... and uh, and this is uh, sometimes I, I like to rib some of my friends that are designers and I, and mm -hmm. I say, you know, design is kind of fascistic in the sense yeah. that, you know, you, you're, uh, you know, you're purporting to know what is right, mm -hmm. designing it as such, and mm -hmm. then putting the people on those rails to behave in those narrower forms of, of, of being and mm -hmm. cultural practices. And if you get that wrong, everyone's fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Totally. So we... we in a sense, we do need those people that are, uh, you know, slow to change. Mm -hmm. That will kind of, we need kind of a drag in the system yeah. to keep us from going too far, too fast, maybe. I, I would say it's what would be really great if we could, again, get more criticality mm. in in the discourse, right. right? So it's not just a matter of a uh, reaction. Mm -hmm. It's actually, you know, the reason why that is not a good direction to go is because of this, this, and this. Do you recognize that that's actually true? Let's have a conversation about that. How do we actually mitigate risks that we're actually identifying, right? But see, that sounds that sounds great to me. Yeah. But I'm on this other side of the cleave that is yeah. into the thinking and rational uh, discourse and figuring yeah. it out. But if you're on the other side of that authoritarian, uh, you know, schism... Yeah. That doesn't even that doesn't even register. I know, you know. <laughs> so it's it's a what big do we problem. Do? Yeah, it's a big problem. So in a way, it almost seems like, uh, dare I say, uh, this? Do we have to kind of resurface and bring back this kind of an elitism of sorts? I mean, but I mean, this is why they're reacting uh, to this in the first place. I mean, this this authoritarian bent, this fearful yeah. uh, side of people are reacting in a sense that there is an elitist class that is telling them they know what needs yeah. to be done and they don't like hearing that. Yeah. But here we are thinking maybe we need to do more of that. Yeah. <laughs> and that might make it worse. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to. It's a scary bum question. you out a little. <laughs> it is a it is a bit of a bummer. Yeah. Um, but I think, like globalization, state state sovereignty, democracy. Mm. What does what what role democracy mm. right in the future? Um, and if if humans are if if human evolution is merging with technology mm -hmm. as it appears to be, I believe so. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So technology will embed with, with our bodies and our bodies will, will connect. And that has always been the case. Yeah. Like every technology, I mean, technology is not something you plug in, right? I mean, the yeah. printing process technology, uh, Absolutely. money is a technology. There's all kinds of things that we create. And, yeah. and, uh, now starting to get at the level of the code. Right. right. So mm -hmm. the code of humanity, the you know DNA. Let's talk about like mm. what is when we have the technological ability to actually control our own evolution yeah. as a species, then we will be different species. I think we're there, right? I mean, it seems like to me, it doesn't seem like evolution can continue like it yeah. did in the past. It seems like it's now precipitated more. It will be more precipitated by actual human decisions yeah. to go this way or that way. Maybe in a personal individual sense, you know, you could yeah. do some gene therapy on yourself or your, your children that you might uh, want to, pro if you want to procreate. Yeah. 
uh, it's kind of out of our hands. I mean, yeah. it's more in our hands, actually. It's less out of our hands. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, it is happening, right? Mm-hmm. It, it is happening. So then, so then the question becomes, okay, for those that are participating in that form of humanity versus the, leg, let's call it the legacy system, mm-hmm. uh, the legacy version of humanity, and there will be this bifurcation that happens. So for those people that are joining this superhuman, mm. you know, Ubermensch, uh, hmm. you know, cadre. What is the moral conversation that they have relative to mm-hmm. the rest of not just humanity, but mammals yep. and hum- mm-hmm. you know animals and hmm. the planet? Like, what what role do they have with respect to stewardship? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it, I, you know, if you extrapolate f- as farther and farther in a possible future, you actually look at, you know legacy humanity as one would look at as a pet Mm. and Mm. an ubermensch, you know, superhuman, uh, techno race Mm. that, that is, uh, that is, has to manage Mm -hmm. a, a global natural system. But see what you're describing, I'm seeing it, that it won't be so consistent. This, this, this overman type, yeah. group it's not going to be consistent within their group it's like the way we choose to oh yeah r- be... change our dna it's like there's going to be there will be each... millions of expressions yes, exactly. of, of of what that is so that kind of creates a new evolution yeah. like which one of those are, are best suited to the environment <laughs> you know what i really want to do i want to just like let's go to singularity university mm. spend some time in the expo- in. Ex- exponential future mm-hmm. and just really get into that because as much as i find it extremely frightening yeah i i want to know more about what it is that I'm afraid of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to understand more about that, uh, that potential future. And I don't, and I will always be critical mm-hmm. of you believe that this is the future. And I think we can say what is, we believe is likely. And we also know that those, that, that the possibility is always there mm-hmm. for, for those things to not actually happen right. or for something calamitous to happen that interrupts that path. Mm-hmm. Right. So there you know, we have, yeah. you know, if you go back far enough, there are these major, you know, extinction events that, uh, that would, you know, intervene in, yeah. in certain points. Um, now when you, the future used to be further away, I I know. (laughs) I mean, even when you're talking in terms of evolutionary biology, I mean, it took generations and generations of of something to be enacted within our code in a way, even culturally, if not uh, genetically. Now it's within one generation. It's within one decade. It's within a couple of years. I mean, we're having such, uh, you know, fast cultural uh, practices that are changing the Mm -hmm. way we do everything. Social media being one of the ones that are, uh, you know, currently on, on board. Um, it just seems like such a haphazard future in terms of how many directions it can go all at once Mm -hmm. that it kind of frightens me in a sense that maybe the only way to contain that might not that it's anybody's decision, but it might be kind of a natural progression of our species. The only way to contain that sort of thing was to be more authoritarian in a way. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe the Chinese model of of government becomes more uh, something that's actually going to be able to practically work because Mm -hmm. if you have, you know, 10 billion individual agents uh, with the power to evolve themselves. What the fuck? <laughs> what does that look like? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, how is that even going to work? Uh, we have no idea. <laughs> and it might not. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I sometimes think that uh, the sense of the individual in our, in our species seems to be kind of uh, a recent thing, really. I mean, mm. the way that we, uh, you know, it's kind of an enlightenment thing where we talk yeah. about the in, in individual as being kind of the primary source of being for ourselves. Yeah. But I wonder if that is kind of a blip in yeah. our uh, evolution, if you want to call it that, in which um, it served us well because we adapted to the environment in, in a way that uh, was better. Mm-hmm. But what if it's just a blip and we're on our way to being more like bees, you know, yeah. or, <laughs> yeah, or yeah. ants? And this was just kind of like a little burst of yeah. uh, creative individualistic energy, but it'll be s- superseded by a more networked. And in fact, the technological innovation seems to indicate that we are kind of moving towards that. Yeah. You know, once we have this 
cyborgification of ourselves. You know, we start implanting some of these uh, computerized devices within us, and then we start networking them. It's already happening. Mm -hmm. uh, you can imagine almost a kind of a new emergent being coming out of this, you know, 10 billion people connected in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of fear for the individual. I mean, I'm, I'm an individualist. Uh, mm -hmm. As much as I think there's great value in, you know, working together and everything, but I really hold on to my individualism. You know, yeah. and I'll fight for that. Of and course. I don't want somebody to, to suppress or oppress me. Yeah. But I'm not sure it's going to necessarily work in the future. And yeah. that, that kind of concerns me. Maybe we're the last generations of people that actually experience that. Oh, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, so one thing I'm thinking about as you're talking there is, mm -hmm. is that uh, this Western this Western version of individuality and liberalism, mm -hmm. um, small l liberalism, in, is both uh, dominant as a hegemonic force within, within uh, the world for the past, you know, let's say, 100 years, let's say, at, mm -hmm. le at least, um, and going farther, uh, farther back from that. And mm -hmm. then, but then we look at the world as it is today, and we go, well, you know, if if I were to apply apply the clash of civilizations lens, mm -hmm. yes, you know, Confucianism and which is more or, oriented towards the collective mm -hmm. than the individual, you know, within Islam, obviously, there's a strong sense of the ummah, the the the, the whole, mm -hmm. you know, the mm -hmm. the wholeness of 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 that and and what that means, um, and and it's and it's also. Um, you know, in other sort of belief systems, mm -hmm. but um, Western individualism and liberalism has managed to um, to create the norms mm -hmm. through a combination of both its own ingenuity and its ability to assert power. Mm -hmm. So, and that could be just an accident of geography and resources in which exactly. uh, some nation state had that power yeah, and certain, was able to, to certain impress places and certain yeah. moments of history happened to have certain technologies yeah. that enabled them to assert their their norms mm -hmm. as the global norms, right? Right. And now all of those global norms are being being challenged, mm -hmm. right? So the Chinese model, the Russian model, mm -hmm. you know, others that are going to emerge the dis um, you know, state failure, mm -hmm. you know, super states that, yep. you know, that may be failing, failing you know, right in, in Europe, in, yep. in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this idea of, of global liberal norms is very much, I think in a, in a fragile, in a fragile state right now, mm -hmm. you know, um, Hillary Clinton is the ultimate expression of that, right? Mm. She strongly believes in those, in yeah. those norms. Right. And in the American, uh, the idea of, of maintaining a, a, uh, a globalized version of the, the American, um, uh, hegemonic structure. Right. Mm -hmm. So in, which is negotiated through treaties and all sorts of relationships, but ultimately is about a setting in place, a set of norms for globalization, for, um, for trade, for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So um, now you see within the Uni United States a, a hardening mm -hmm. um, minority that is actually rejecting globalization. Mm -hmm. You see that within the UK and with Brexit, you see it in, right. in Europe. So, so the globalization and the liberal Western experiment mm -hmm. is very much... I think right now on, on the table as a question mark. That's true. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so it becomes really interesting to explore mm -hmm. those alternative futures where you now those norms aren't there. Right. right. What does that mean? You know, how do we, how do we maintain the good in a different set of norms uh, mm -hmm. globally? Um, and so I believe that, um, that those things are uh, were constructed by humans. They can be destroyed by humans, and that ultimately, uh, it's maybe not for me to say what is what the right answer is mm. going to be because I'm not going to be alive hmm. in the time 
when that well it may or may not be depends on my access on technology things, yeah <laughs> the accelerated trajectory of things yeah, yeah. who knows it might could be next year could, could, could happen <laughs> um but but i think that's that's where i think it's really important um so i'm i'm really interested right now around uh, this a new that new generation that millennial generation about saying we need to have these conversations about people that really have a str- a stronger stake in the future Mm -hmm. than those people that are sitting in, in those, in those power positions right now. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel, you know, as a generation X person, you know, Mm -hmm. as you are, Mm -hmm. um, we have an important role to play. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't step up to that role. It's very true. Which is let's you, you, you two people, the people that came before us, the people that come out for us are, completely different worlds you know Mm -hmm. they have a conversation with sometimes around the dinner table in their families Mm -hmm. um and sometimes when a so for example in in innovation world you know the senior you know the the aging ceo Mm -hmm. says we need to innovate i'm going to create a room put a bunch of millennials in it and they're going to come up with something awesome um and meanwhile there's like the transmission of wisdom Mm. you know, intergenerationally in order to make it useful in a creative sense for, for those that are actually shaping the future is to me in a really important role. And it's a role that people that are, um, the the pioneers of the digital Mm -hmm. world have to serve, you know, it's like, it's great that you're working on your, on your retirement and trying to get your, your payout, you know, mm. cause that's your age, your breath age now. It's like, we're, mm. we're becoming more conservative because we need to think about our future in a different way. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a social role that we could be playing that we're not often. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're trying very hard to, to understand, uh, ourselves and our species. And, uh, it sounds like we're talking a lot today about, uh, you know, intelligence and neurology. And, and another interesting thing that keeps coming up in my conversations recently is, is the neurology of an artificial intelligence that Mm. is just kind of around the corner. Uh, I think, um, that's going to change a lot of things. Uh, you know, it seems like, uh, and I kind of, only half jokingly say that uh, I'm doing these podcasts because I, I kind of uh, anticipate in the, in the near future there's going to be a super intelligence that's going to suck all of this up and mm-hmm. uh, make a model of me and come to know me yeah. in a sense that we're going to have a, a relationship yeah. <laughs> with this this super intelligence. Yeah. Oh. And so all of us are kind of kind of doing this. Like I whatever. need to create more digital artifacts <laughs> right. right now. Otherwise, it's not going to know you. I really do. Yeah, and uh, it's going to want to be friends with the people that have been talking about him for the last uh, <laughs> for the last twenty years. It's like Donald years. Trump. Are you talking about me? <laughs> then you're a friend of mine. That's right. Right. But again, here, here's another thing that that holds a lot of promise, but but it could also be terrifying. I mean, yeah. this is the talk of the singularity. When you have a uh, being that. Uh, turns on in some sense and uh, has the capacity to modify itself and evolve itself yeah. millions of times a second. I mean, we're talking oh, yeah. about doing our, you know, for ourselves where you can change your genetic makeup in some sense, but uh, this being will be able to do it millions of times a second. Yeah. So it's going to leave us behind very quickly. Yeah. And uh, I that hope is that the singularity. Yeah. And I hope it has a kind of an appreciation for, for antiques like <laughs> us. <laughs> To well, keep us around. You speaking know? of other mm. media that, and this mm. is like, um, it's an amazing time for, for the, the medium formerly called television. Mm. Um, like Westworld, you know, is, yeah, I, I just, just started watching, I just started yeah. watching Westworld. Yeah. And, it, and you know, it's what I love about that is like setting the emergence of, uh, sentient androids mm. in the context of, a, a West, an archaic Western, you know, <laughs> right. uh, context as a, as a, an amusement park, um, and is, brought to, to, to being just for our entertainment uh, yes. as well, which is likely scenario of how things will play. Right. Out. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, is an incredible premise. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I'm really excited about, what, about where it's going to go. Cause I'm, you know, three episodes in, but, yeah. um, but this is what I'm, why I'm so excited about, and I'm coming back to the media question mm. and the Canadian content question, mm. you know, is come on, mm. like it's time that as Canadians, 
we were actually had the shackles taken off mm -hmm. to be able to create uh, the kinds of stories and imaginings of the future and of our present and of our past that uh, actually help us make sense of, of the world, mm -hmm. right? Because it's great that, you know, Westworld is there and it's expressing itself within a, an American cultural context of mm -hmm. the Western, right? right? And, and from HBO, you it's know, they're making... Frontier in uh, two ways, yeah. They're making fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's so, it's such an exciting time to be actually involved in the making of culture. Yeah. Right. And, and, and whatever cultural products those, those things are, mm -hmm. um, and so relevant and so important to actually make sense mm -hmm. of where we've come from and where we're going. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the state of, of cultural media, you know, is so in terms of its institutions are so broken, mm -hmm. um, right now. And there's so much stuff that they could be working on that be yeah. like, interesting, entertaining, like thought provoking, have those conversations afterwards around virtual water coolers, mm -hmm. um, to, to actually make sense of the future. But there's such a dispersal now. I mean, it used to be like the media was kind of like a hose that, mm. you know, you drank in, but now it's like a wide sprinkler that's a mile wide and mm. there's all kinds of things being sprayed everywhere. And it's kind of hard to have an impact globally in a sense, uh, unless, um, I mean, the media um, objects or, or, or subjects or whatever they are, the creations that have this uh, impact globally tend to be more of the dumbed down, you know, yeah popular uh simplified versions of things and mm -hmm. but maybe it has always been been such and even yeah. you know literature and uh you know drama and theater it always dealt in these uh you know um stereotypical and um for sure cliche ways of seeing the world absolutely yeah. and and you know there's it's not f not everything is for everybody mm -hmm. so uh but i think there's um for a group of people you know that are educated that are asking questions that there is a is a huge um, need right now for for us to be having the kinds of conversations that we've just been having right now and mm -hmm. and in within a within our culture um, because if so if a politician can't even say we're we need to be thinking about yeah. you know a a a future where technology has created uh, lots of unemployment mm -hmm. or has taken away a lot of jobs that were traditionally mm -hmm. those that a lot of people could do if if they're not actually able to say those words mm -hmm. because the within the culture a space hasn't even been created in the public mind it's true for that mm -hmm. then we're in a big big trouble I agree. Right. I, you know, I don't know if you listen to other podcasts, but it feels like there's a lot of uh, podcasts seem to be filling that uh, that they purpose do. a little bit. There's a lot of discussions in depth going on with these various uh, podcasters right now mm -hmm. that you would you didn't find in the media before, and it's kind of this freedom of the internet that allows that. Yeah. And, I, and I love that long yeah. form, thoughtful. Yeah. You it's know. back. It's back, baby. <laughs> right. Long I mean, form. People used to buy tickets to go listen to people yeah. <laughs> talk yeah. for two, three hours. Yeah, and that's why, like, I, I love, you know, I think you described what you were trying to do a little bit around the idea of the salon, mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, having, having gone through a period where I would convene people in kinds of dialogues in person mm -hmm. that were salon like yeah um you know i i really value it and mm -hmm. um so it's great that it's filling that 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 need and and i'm so i'm yeah i'm definitely collecting lots of mm -hmm. lots of stuff and i'm and i'm realizing like i almost want to have a longer commute <laughs> right. so that i can listen, listen to, to it to all them. yeah um, that's why I bicycle a lot uh, this summer. I, I yeah. got to listen to a lot of them while biking. That's yeah. that's, that's that's good. So I do mm -hmm. I do bike to work, but unfortunately my bike ride's only ten minutes long. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but um, but what's what's interesting to me is like podcast is filling that that void. Mm -hmm. Then there's you know mainstream media um, with commercial media, which is completely like it's. You, I, I watch it now. I haven't had cable television in a long time. Mm -hmm. And when I watch what's on there, it's just, this is crazy. It's disheartening. Right? It's really yeah. disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, but the exciting part is that 
Um, there's enough of this kind of conversation happening now that mm -hmm. people are starting, it, people are sharing it. You know, people say, hey, check this out. And, mm -hmm. and that, that's happening. But again, it's happening within our bubble. Yeah. Yeah. It is. But, but I, I kind of hold out hope that the, the millennials are actually embracing that more, oh, yeah. than, more than our generation. And sure. uh, there's some hope there. At least they're, they're open to talking about it. They're open to meeting in person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, congregating yeah. uh, around the table and, and discussing things. And, and this yeah. is kind of what I'm trying to do in this very space that we're in right now. Uh, we have a lot of events organized here. Yeah. More so lately towards the artistic creative, like music yeah. shows, DJs. We're going to have a stand-up comedy here soon. Oh, really? So if you're into it, you can That's cool. <laughs> try that out, have an open mic or something <laughs> like that. But uh, this, this uh, you know, the millennials, hipsters, whatever you want to call it, they seem to be embracing the, the older ways of yeah. being. Well, you're in the junction. <laughs> That's true. So the junction. Yeah. So we're talking about really old technology, yeah. right? The railways. Yeah forming a place and then rediscovering that place mm -hmm. and as a creative neighborhood, right? Yeah, what a cool place, actually. Yeah, it is. It's, it's yeah. a fantastic. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and this is what I've always been fascinated by is that the, you know, the, the in within cities and how mm -hmm. cities evolve and, and, and how those kinds of old medias come back in different mm -hmm. forms. And so in hipsterism has, has yeah. a lot of that, mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting. Um, this, the idea of a con conversation, I've been having a conversation with a number of people, uh, recently is saying basically around these questions of where are we going? What's the future? What's mm -hmm. the role of people that are designers? What are the roles of people that are doing innovation work? What are we going to make sense of it? Um, what is the morality of it? What mm -hmm. if, how do we think about it critically? Um, I've been having a lot of those conversations one-on-one, -on -one and, and there is a need, I think, right now to be having more of those conversations in a more uh, coherent place, you know, in this place. So... Uh, Jesse Hirsch and I talked about that actually. Oh, he was a guest uh, here. Uh, yeah, I figured yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd have Jesse. He's great. Um, yeah. Well, he, he said something interesting that, that I repeated a few times. He said the singularity is already here, that the super intelligence is just shy. Shy. To come out. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, that's right. amazing and so Jesse. It's so Jesse shy. It's true. Uh, it yeah. You're right. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, like, it's, it's genius. Yeah. Um, but, but this is what, what's interesting is, and again, um, speaking tribally, uh, there is a group of people that I identify with, the people of my tribe that, you know, in 2000, 2003, four, five, six, seven, let's say in that period, mm -hmm. you know, social media emergence, blogging, Twitter, et cetera, all that kind of stuff was happening. And the people that happened to be of the right age, that they were early adopters of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and were technologists and designers mm -hmm. and thinkers and of different kinds yeah. connecting. My and, peeps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, 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 that it was a magical period of time, mm -hmm. really, really magical. And oh, I don't yeah. think people really necessarily like people that weren't of that group mm -hmm. really appreciate what was happening at that time. Things were happening. It, things were definitely happening. Mm -hmm. And then now looking back, there's like, Oh, there's, you know, mm -hmm. some of the hopey changey went mm -hmm. down a little bit and mm -hmm. you know, reality asserted itself. And, and some of those people have gone on and they're doing amazing things in different fields and, but they're not as connected as more, as much anymore. They're not as active, mm -hmm. I would say. Are um, they co-opted in some sense? They are, they're busy mm -hmm. life, you know, yeah. like yeah. it's almost guaranteed that you fall into that. Yeah. Well, if, if, mm. you know, um, you don't have kids. No, I, I don't have kids. No, it's a very luxurious uh, situation to be. <laughs> yeah. So when you don't have kids, yeah. it's really easy. It's mm -hmm. easier, let's say, yeah. um, than when you, than when you do. And, um, but when I think about that group of people and I think about, oh, we should get the band back together, yeah. <laughs> which I have a feeling this podcast is part of that. <laughs> right. Uh, get, let's get the band back together. Mm -hmm. And because there was something that was, it was both like how we were meeting, how we were interacting with each other, the things that we were talking about. And also there was a bunch of shared values, mm -hmm. right? And the values I think are really, really the inter most interesting part right. um, because they were non-authoritarian, non-authoritarian, uh, um, 
you know, progressive in the open source, open in the very source general sense. Yeah. yeah very open mm. source, very sharing economy mm-hmm. yeah. oriented, very much um, liberating, you know, mm-hmm. very liberating in a uh, set of set of norms. And, um, and I think that there's, it's important to go back to that time and actually uh, really interrogate what those values were and where they've gone mm-hmm. and how they've, how, and what, what those values are being challenged by. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think that's an important part for our generation is we have a story to tell mm-hmm. about the emergence of a socially and digitally interconnected planet. Yeah. Right. We were there and we making were, it happen. It, we were either building the stuff, <laughs> yeah. creating the first content that went on, on, on that stuff, mm-hmm. finding each other, sharing yeah. practices. I didn't learn what I do today in school. I learned it yeah. by in, connecting with people that were practitioners and were saying, I share my stuff. Mm-hmm. I talk about my stuff. I share my stuff. Let's do stuff together. Mm-hmm. And that's how I developed my practice. Right. And now we, as a company, hire people who are trained in that stuff in schools, mm. right? So now those things have been codified and turned into educational curriculum and you can actually learn how to do that stuff. And so for that's, that's a maturation, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, there's an evolution there. What's interesting to me is that I think for new generations getting into the fields of digital and create creative creativity and digital Mm -hmm. and design. Um, Some of them come from that shared sense of values and Mm -hmm. some of them don't, right? right? Some of them, it's just like, well, in the eighties, it was all about the MBA and now it's about design, Mm. right? So now design is the new MBA. So I'm going to go do this and Mm -hmm. because I want to be successful. And so I'm going to get a job for, you know, these firms that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And let's say, large consulting firms that have acquired design companies and in order to get the talent. Mm -hmm. And I asked some of those people and says, so, so what's the purpose Hmm. of what you are doing? Good question. Mm -hmm. Right. Why are you doing what you're doing, where you're doing it? Right. And because when, when we were, we were incubating, Mm -hmm. um, what we thought was a revolution, um, it was driven by a set by a set of values, mm-hmm. and 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 we don't talk about it hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where, when I talk about intergenerational wisdom, I think that's part of the conversation, mm-hmm. right? So those of us of that tribe that had those values and and created the infrastructure that the the next generation picked up and built mm-hmm. upon we have to tell the story of the beliefs and the dreams and the values that the, were embedded in those technologies and in those designs and in those think in those, in those thoughts mm-hmm. and ideas. Yeah. Because th- those people that are now adopting and building upon that are coming to it, not being raised by that tribe. Right. They were raised by a different tribe. Mm-hmm. Right with different values. And so we have, you know, this, this complicated relationship between, uh, you know, a boomer, you know, boomers who raised millennials and now have adopted the the Gen X platforms Mm -hmm. and the Gen X folks are going, hello, we're back here. Remember us? (laughs) You know, we have a story to tell. And we're starting to tell it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hopeful. I am too. Yeah. Um, let's wind us down. Thank, wind it. Thank you very much, Mark. That was uh, that was a great conversation. I, I. This is a lot of fun. High five. High five. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thanks. Thank you. That was awesome. That's great. Thanks.